Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots like you to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Scott Denstead about his easy WX Brief weather app that not only briefs you on the weather, but also compares it against your personal minimums to help you with decision making. And we'll be talking about magazine columnist Martha Lunken's decision last year to fly under a bridge. Last week in episode 184, we talked with Boeing test pilot John Tugas about his total engine failure while he was IFR in a beach bonanza. So if you didn't hear that episode, I really encourage you to check it out. And I'd also like to ask for your help in growing the show. If you would take a moment right now, find the share button on whatever app that you're using to listen to me right now and share Aviation News Talk with a friend who you think might benefit from the show and then follow up with him or her to follow or subscribe to the show. Thanks so much for your help. This week in the news, the NTSB cites the failure of see and avoid. Electric aircraft are much quieter than we thought, and a woman in Oklahoma has been accused of taking money from pilots. All this and more, and the news starts now. Well, we have more stories of airline hiring. In episode 142 back in March 2021, at the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about how people training to become airline pilots would probably see their plans pushed back a couple of years, but that they should keep working on their certificates and building hours. And now we're seeing that recovery. American Airlines, according to this story from DallasNews.com, is starting to hire pilots again for the first time since the pandemic began. It says American Airlines will start hiring pilots again this fall, hoping to add nearly 900 aviators by the end of 2022. American said it plans to recall all formerly furloughed pilots back to active status by the end of the summer as well. American's plans call for hiring about 300 new pilots by the end of the year and double that number in 2022, trying to make up for the thousand pilots who have retired due to age or who took early retirement during the pandemic. Its pilot plan comes as airlines boost schedules in anticipation of a strong summer flying season. COVID vaccination distribution and fatigue from the virus have travelers buying tickets at levels not seen since before the pandemic. Hiring pilots is a stark change from just a few months ago when American Airlines was threatening to furlough more workers without additional government payroll support, including 1,850 pilots. The carrier also plans to honor its job offers to pilots hired before the pandemic, but who never made it into training or an American Airlines cockpit. The sudden demand for new pilots could put a strain on regional airlines where those pilots are now employed. About half of new pilots at American come from one of its regional airlines, including Envoy, PSA, and Piedmont. American said it will coordinate with its wholly owned subsidiary regional airlines to make sure the pipeline of new pilots doesn't disrupt flying. And in a related story, this comes from avweb.com, Southwest to recall pilots and flight attendants. Southwest is recalling 209 pilots and more than 2,700 flight attendants to meet summer travel needs. The pilots and flight attendants had participated in the company's extended time off program in which they accepted partial pay for a minimum of six months and retained certain benefits, travel privileges, and health care coverage. The cockpit and cabin crew members will return to work on June 1. Of course, the pilots will need to complete all the necessary requalification and recurrent training before returning to the flight deck, according to Southwest. As of December 2020, Southwest had 8,500 active pilots, down from 9,300 the year before. Of nearly 6,000 employees overall, the airline also has a total of approximately 16,000 flight attendants on the payroll. The 2,700 plus who are being recalled represent all those who participated in the extended time off program. From avweb.com, NTSB report cites failure of sea and avoid in Alaska midair. And before we start the story, let me tell you that sea and avoid, of course, is the FAA's name for the primary method of separating VFR aircraft, which of course is to use your eyeballs and look out the window. I've always thought it's optimistic to rely on that as the sole method of avoiding other aircraft. And instead of calling it sea and avoid, I tell my clients that it should be called hope and pray. And apparently the NTSB agrees that sea and avoid has its limitations. Here's the story. The NTSB unanimously agreed on the probable cause of a May 2019 mid-air collision in Alaska that killed six and injured ten. The board cited obstructed views due to aircraft structure and passengers and the lack of an oral traffic alert in crowded airspace. The pilot and four passengers in a de Havilland Beaver float plane 
operated by a mountain air service, died, as well as one passenger in a de Havilland Otter operated by Taquan Air when they collided at 3,350 feet. The rest of the passengers in the Otter survived, along with a pilot. All the passengers on both aircraft were from the same cruise ship and were on noontime sightseeing flights to Misty Ford's National Monument near Ketchikan, where the aircraft were based. According to Board Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, sea and avoid was not sufficient in the high-traffic sightseeing area where the float planes were operating. Board Chairman Robert Sumwalt cited preoccupation with matters unrelated to flight duties, such as attempting to provide passengers with a scenic view and physiological limits on the human vision, reducing the time opportunity to see and avoid other aircraft. The NTSB also noted the Beaver pilot would have had his view obstructed just before the collision by the airplane's structure, as well as the passenger to his right. In addition, a window post would have impeded the outer pilot from spotting the Beaver in time, according to the board's findings. The board's human performance specialist noted that the outer pilot last recalled looking at his in-cockpit traffic display about four minutes before the collision. The probable cause finding from the board also cited the lack of an FAA requirement for oral and visual traffic alerts on airplanes carrying passengers. From generalaviationnews.com, a new study, Pilots Downplay the Impact of Stress on Flight Safety. New research from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland has found that GA pilots did not consider stress to be as great a risk to flight safety as other factors such as weather. This is contrary to guidance from flight safety bodies that state stress can compromise performance. A team of researchers from the Applied Psychology and Human Factors, or APHF, group at the university set out to examine the risk perception of GA pilots and how this impacts decision-making in relation to takeoff, specifically in deciding whether it is suitable and safe to take off or not. The study, published in the journal Aviation Psychology and Applied Human Factors, showed that GA pilots were more likely to take off in scenarios involving a pilot under stress or missing equipment such as checklists or sunglasses, However, they were less likely to proceed in scenarios depicting a pilot who was ill, an aircraft with a faulty airspeed indicator, or a faulty seatbelt. According to one researcher, the idea behind the study was to determine whether GA pilots viewed all the various categories of risk as equally risky, or whether certain types of risk might be more likely to be ignored or managed in favor of a positive takeoff decision. In terms of decision-making, GA pilots face very different challenges than their commercial counterparts, to address these GA-specific challenges, studies like this are necessary so we can better understand potential areas of concern for future safety and training programs. The team presented 101 pilots with a series of 12 takeoff scenarios across four hazard categories comprising performance such as pilot stress, fatigue or ill, environmental hazards, thunderstorm, ice or wind, faulty equipment such as power, noise or airspeed indication, and missing equipment, checklists, sunglasses, or seatbelts. Pilots were then asked if they would proceed in each scenario and to explain their reasoning. The researcher said the results suggest that not all of our scenarios were judged to be equally risky. The pilots' reasoning for their decision suggests that although they were aware of the risk of flying while ill or tired, the pilots considered flights to be a stress-relieving activity, so they were less likely to cancel a flight based on being under stress. This is despite guidance from aviation regulatory bodies such as the FAA indicating that stress can potentially compromise flight performance. From generalaviationnews.com, flight testing reveals electric aircraft reduce noise pollution. Magni-X has shared results from flight testing of the e-Beaver aircraft, which company officials say, quote, demonstrate a significant reduction in noise pollution from an electric aircraft versus a conventional one. These results further highlight the benefits of electric aviation. Several studies have shown the negative impact aircraft noise has on people, including adverse effects to both physical and mental health, MagniX officials noted. In fact, one study published by Noise and Health International Journal found that aircraft noise is one of the most detrimental environmental effects of aviation. In particular, the study stated that it can disrupt sleep, adversely affect academic performance in children, and even increase the risk for cardiovascular disease of people living near airports. Quote, this is a growing problem as air traffic has been increasing year over year. Electric aviation will reduce these issues, company officials said. When compared to the standard Beaver aircraft, the e-Beaver recorded noise decreases ranging from 16 to 22 dBA across all phases of flight. Specifically at takeoff phase, the e-Beaver recorded noise levels of 20.8 dBA lower on average and 24 dBA lower at peak compared to the standard Beaver, 
meaning noise energy is at least 100 times lower, company officials explain. Now let me just take a moment and talk about the decibel scales, which are logarithmic. And so let's try and quantify what a 16 to 22 dBA difference would mean. So for every 3 dB uh, gain, there's a doubling of noise. So if you can reduce noise by 3 dB, you've cut the noise in half. A 6 dB reduction means you've cut the noise in half twice. So now the sound is only 25% as loud as it was before. So I ran through the calculations. A 16 dB reduction in noise cuts the noise to about 2% of the original level, and a 22 dB reduction is well under 1%, which tells us the electric version of this beaver is really very quiet. From avweb.com, Sierra Tracks launches nationwide scanning network for digitizing aircraft logbooks. Sierra Tracks, and that's S I E R R A T R A X, announced today the launch of its nationwide scanning network, which provides a secure route for aircraft owners and operators to convert their paper logbooks into digitized records and store them safely in Sierra Tracks cloud service. Through Sierra Tracks' new digital aircraft record solution, what can often be boxes of paper records can be professionally scanned and transcribed into Sierra Tracks. Using advanced AI or artificial intelligence, records including log entries, 8130 parts traceability forms, 337s, and handwritten logs are automatically organized into relevant categories and made searchable. Users of the service can privately share and quickly search records by entering a simple keyword or date, allowing for easy inspection of records for Part 91 and Part 135 operations, as well as maintenance facilities. For more information, go out to sierratracks.com. From a Flying Magazine at flyingmag.com, Piper debuts the new Piper 100i at Sun and Fun. It may look like the PA-28 that you finally recall from your private pilot training or instrument work, or one that a family member treasured as a solid cruiser over many hours of happy flying, but there's more than meets the eye when we're talking about the latest addition to Piper Aircraft's flight training fleet, the Piper 100i. After a long wait, the company is showing off serial number 17 at the Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo, giving folks a chance to see up close the subtle differences that lay beneath the new white paint. The airplane achieved type certification in December 2020, and deliveries began to American Flyers, the Texas-based flight training organization, which accepted eight aircraft in 2020. So what's new? Piper took the opportunity to make a number of changes to the way the aircraft came together on the production line, saving hours and cost in manufacturing that have been passed along to customers. The price stays under $300,000 as a result. The flight deck hosts a Garmin G3X, and a Lycoming IO360 B4A pushes out 180 horsepower from under the cowl. The airplane makes an honest 128 knots, and fit and finish inside has evolved from early days. The 2021 production is currently sold out, and new delivery positions are being sold for 2022. From avweb.com, Buy Aerospace introduces an eight-seat e-flyer. And listeners to this show may recall that when we interviewed George Bai in August 2020, in episode 160, he talked about this product then. And now Buy Aerospace officials have unveiled its new eight-seat e-flyer 800 all-electric twin turboprop class aircraft design. Aimed at the air taxi, air cargo, regional, and charter aircraft markets, the e-flyer 800 will feature two wing-mounted electric motors with dual redundant motor windings, quad redundant battery packs, and a whole airframe parachute. According to Buy, operating costs for the aircraft will be one-fifth out of traditional twin turboprops. The E-Flyer 800 is the first all-electric propulsion technology airplane that achieves twin turboprop performance and safety with no CO2 and extremely low costs, said Buy Aerospace CEO George Buy. This type of remarkable economy and performance is made possible by the electric propulsion system and advanced battery cell technology that results in significantly higher energy densities. By Aerospace is working with Safran on an electric powertrain for the E-Flyer 800, which is expected to have a top cruise speed of up to 320 knots, 35,000 foot ceiling, and 500 nautical mile range with 45 minute IFR reserves. The company is also looking at offering an emergency auto land system for the aircraft, along with options for supplemental power solar cells and in-wheel electric taxi. From AOPA.org, extracting visibility information from weather cameras. And this is an article written by Tom George, who we had on the show here in episode 183. Deriving visibility information from weather cameras has been in the works for several years, and you may be in a position to help determine if it's ready for prime time. 
the Visibility Estimation Through Image Analytics, or VEIA, VIA program, looks at FAA weather camera images and derives an estimate of the visibility using an automated comparison to clear day images. The FAA began evaluating this product starting in April. They are looking for Alaskan pilots willing to help with the analysis by looking at the camera-derived visibility, examining observations, and completing a questionnaire. If successful, this program could significantly expand the number of locations across the state of Alaska where visibility information is provided to the aviation community. A variety of techniques have been explored to derive visibility estimates from weather camera observations, including image processing and crowdsourcing techniques. For several years, FAA-funded research has been underway at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory to use image processing techniques to derive visibility from weather camera data. Images from approximately 10 days of observations are used to develop a best clear day composite image. New images from the camera are then compared with a composite image. An edge detection algorithm using a ratio technique is used to estimate visibility in statute miles. This technique only works during the daytime when there is adequate illumination to create suitable images. All participants are asked to use the VIS system and participate in two virtual meetings to provide feedback to the evaluation team. At the end of the assessment, each participant is expected to complete a final questionnaire. And if you're an Alaskan pilot and you'd like to sign up, you'll find a link to the registration site in our show notes. And finally, from AOPA.org, an Oklahoma aeromedical consultant accused of bilking pilots. An Oklahoma woman has been charged with 10 felonies for allegedly taking money from pilots to help resolve medical certification issues without rendering services, according to court documents filed by the state's attorney general. The defendant said she is confident she will be exonerated. A probable cause affidavit filed March 29th before the state district court in Oklahoma City alleges that a woman doing business as Oklahoma Aviation Medical Consulting, or OK Aviation Medical Consulting, collected fees ranging from $500 to $1,700 from nine pilots between 2018 and 2020. In each case, state investigators found the pilots sought the services to expedite the issuance of their airman medical certificate, paid up front, and got nothing in return. The woman's lawyer wrote to AOPA and said that she was charged in the case without any investigation into her side of the story. She has a lot of documentation as to the work she performed, and the documentation will be presented to the prosecutor for the attorney general's office. She faces a separate felony charge for each of the nine pilots who told state investigators that they had paid for services not received, each punishable by up to 10 years in prison and a $5,000 fine. In many cases, according to the affidavit, customers lost much more than the money paid for help with their medical certificate application. Some reported FAA denials with no paperwork having been filed, one pilot had to return months early from a work assignment in Africa after his flying privileges lapsed, costing him $24,000 in lost compensation. The company's website was offline in early April, but there was evidence of outraged customers on the internet, including social media sites where posts dating to 2018 urged pilots to avoid the company. A Facebook group called I Got Ripped Off by OK Aviation Medical Consulting has 88 members, many of whom told their stories to the state's attorney general. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, my weekly updates, including the Martha Lunkin story, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here's another fun flying destination, which is Jefferson City, Missouri. Hey, Max. My name is Leah, and I'm recording this for a fun flying destination. I currently fly out of KJF, and I'm a student pilot for Kilo Juliet Echo Foxtrot. We have a really nice airport with two paved runways, a control tower, and a really nice FBO. You can come and get a rental car and drive over town, or you could just stay at the airport. And by April 15th, we will have a new restaurant um, with a new flight school portion, outdoor seating, and it's going to be awesome. So I hope that anyone who's interested just might stop over in a little heart of the Midwest. Leah, thank you so much for sending that fun flying destination and congratulations for being a student pilot. It's great to see that you're already getting involved in lots of other aspects of aviation already. And if you have a favorite place you'd like to tell everyone about, go ahead and do what Leah did. And that is use your smartphone, look for the voice memos app, and you can record about 90 seconds and then email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com.
Now, a couple weeks ago in episode 182, we had AOPA's Tom George, who lives up in Alaska with us, talking about PIREPS. At the time I talked with Tom, we also recorded a couple short segments where he talked about the River Watch program, which was news to me. I had never heard of that, as well as talking about the way they paint gravel strips in Alaska for short field practice. So here's that conversation with Tom George. Up here, and I think they do it in some other parts of the country, the National Weather Service supports what they call a river watch project. Oh, I read about that. Where mm-hmm. they, in, and typically this is, in Alaska, this is in the spring when the rivers are breaking up. In other words, the we're starting to make that transition from the, the snow and ice to the liquid water season. And of course, that doesn't always happen gracefully. And at times there's pretty serious flooding at, at communities that are along the, the major rivers. And the weather service puts, you know, they contract to go fly their hydrologist around to look at things. But in recent years, their budget's been cut. And of course, last year then with COVID made that even more exciting. So we ramped up here and actually uh, made a significant effort to get people to put on a little bit of training and then get people to go out and fly river watch missions. And, and in a lot of cases with their iPhone, the cameras on their smartphone, take pictures and then email them to uh, the weather service who actually can tag them geographically and have them appear on a map. And they found that very helpful. The program's been going on for years just based on pilot reports. The notion is, well, file a pilot report, you know, if you see a certain kind of condition happening. Well, that's worked, but there's a whole bunch of training to know what kind of ice conditions you're talking about. I mean, there's a whole technology to the world of of river ice and, and flooding, lifted sheets and ice fronts and things like that. Whereas taking a picture of something and emailing it, it's a lot easier. And yet the hydrologists get a lot of value out of that. So that's something that, that we did last year. And I think we'll be doing, we'll kind of be trying to promote again this year. But I think it also happens in other parts of the country. And where do people find out more information about that? Uh, the Weather Service has a page with information on it here in Alaska. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. And I, I think I probably wrote a blog post about it last year. I'll see if I can find one of those which should, which might have something on it. So I'll send you that. The other thing that started a few years ago is we were noticing a bunch of accidents with off-field operations, which, of course, for some people, that's the whole reason they learn to fly, is to fly super cubs and land on gravel bars and and places either either just for fun or for hunting or camping or whatever. And when you're in a state that doesn't have many roads and is a fifth the size of the U.S., that's how you get around to a lot of places. So we ran this through FAA Airports Division, and they now allow us under controlled conditions to go out on some of our gravel runways and paint a practice runway. So on the, the gravel runway at Fairbanks International Airport, where I'm based, and we call that the ski strip because it's used in the winter for ski operations. We go out in the spring and we paint, I think it's two by four foot rectangles, 25 feet apart to simulate a 25 foot wide runway. And then we make repeat those marks at 100 foot intervals for 800 feet. And we do it on both ends of the runway. So you can come in on that 3,000 foot, 75 foot, wide, I think, gravel strip. And here in the middle of it, you have these marks that mark out a 25 foot wide and 800 foot long bush strip. And you practice your touch and goes there. And so you figure out, could I really get stopped in 600 feet like I tell all my friends I can or not? And that's a volunteer effort that coordinated with the airport that we go out in the spring, get make a party out of it, take about a dozen people and and paint those marks and depending on the year, we might come back once and have to repaint them partway through the season. But we now have approval to do that at six airports in Alaska and not all of them are doing it, but that's been a project which started with an aviation safety emphasis. But the secondary benefit if you're in the airport advocacy business is it puts you in touch with the people that manage your airport and allows you to build build relationships in a project that almost everybody sees as a positive one 
which makes it a whole lot easier to talk to airport management when you're facing an issue that maybe isn't so popular. So kind of a side benefit toward airport advocacy that, that comes out of that. So those are just a couple little things happening out there that kind of keep us agitated and, and, and having fun. So which months of the year roughly would the paint be visible on the gravel runways? We typically try and paint in early May, as soon as the runway's dried enough from the seasonal snow getting off of it. And unless the marks get worn off, they'd be visible until early October, which is when you're starting to get snow cover again to cover them up. And, and actually hunting season in the fall is probably right before hunting season is when they get the most use because people have kind of maybe not done much flying all year before they take their super cub out. Okay, quick, let's go do some practice. So, so it's that three months or so in the summer that, uh, and three months is what summer is here. So <laughs> I'll, I'll send you a link to a blog post or something on, on that as well. And, and I don't know, I mean, I'm actually trying to ramp up our, our materials on that and try and get some more airports in Alaska to do it. It's not something you would do at every airport by any stretch of the imagination, but, yeah. but I'm sure there are places where it would be an appropriate thing to do elsewhere. And we've put together a how to guide, um, which I'm actually revising at the moment to update it a little bit, but would help people, but you do have to get the blessing of the FA airports division, depending on what kind of an airport, you know, if you've got federal money in your airport, it's there's some red tape that has to be uh, dealt with in order to do a project like that. My thanks again to Tom George for talking with us about uh, practice runways as well as about the Riverwatch program. He sent along some links, and those will be in our show notes. You can always find the show notes by swiping on whatever app you're in, or just go out on the web to aviationnewstalk.com slash 185 for episode 185 to find all of our show notes. And now let's talk about the FAA case involving Martha Lunkin, about whom much has been written over the past week in the aviation press and on social media. Of all the articles I've read, AvWeb seems to have the most complete coverage, so let me read parts of that article. It's called uh, Bridge Stunt Leads to ADSB Revocation. A well-known Ohio pilot and aviation columnist may be the first to run afoul of a new regulation triggered by the ADSB mandate enacted in 2020. Martha Lunkin, age 78, who pens a popular aviation column, flew under a bridge near her home airport, which bears her name in southern Ohio in March of 2020, an impulsive and immature stunt she told AvWeb she knew was wrong. And I've read elsewhere that she said she did it on a whim, which is rather surprising coming from someone who was an FAA inspector for many years, including running the FAA safety program in southern Ohio. Anyway, getting back to the article... But a coincidental malfunction of her Cessna 180's transponder with ADSB out may have resulted in her being slapped with an emergency revocation of all her certificates instead of the suspension that normally accompanies such transgressions. So apparently what this means is that normally a pilot who might fly under a bridge would just have their pilot certificates suspended for some period of time, some number of months. But a pilot who purposely tries to evade detection by turning off their ADSB out signal under the new rule, has all of their certificates revoked, which means they're just gone. And the only way to get them back is to fly with an instructor and then take a new check ride for every certificate you want to get back. Now, what's in dispute is why the transponder wasn't working. Continuing with the article, Lunkin said that after she crossed flying under a bridge from her bucket list, she headed home and checked in with Cincinnati Approach and was told her transponder was off. She said she reset it and set a new code, and it resumed working. In their subsequent investigation, FAA officials determined that she'd shut it off on purpose to stop the system from tracking her while she threw caution to the wind. Lunkin, a longtime former FAA safety inspector and veteran flight instructor, vehemently denies the charge. I know what I did in that cockpit, and I did not turn it off, she said. The agency used a new section of its Legal Enforcement Actions Guidebook for FAA staff which calls for revocation of a certificate for, quote, operating an aircraft without activated transponder or ADSB out transmission for the purpose of evading detection. The section was added in a package of other amendments in January of 2020, just after ADSB became mandatory in most controlled airspace and about 
two months before Lunkin's flight. Lunkin said she took the 180 to her avionics tech, who said the transponder seemed to be loose in its mount when he took it out. It tested fine on the bench and after it was reinstalled. The FAA interviewed the tech. Lunkin said the tech was unable to tell them whether the device was malfunctioning during flight. She said now it's her word against the FAA's on whether the intermittent ADSB out signal was a malfunction or a crime. She said radar tracks that were part of the evidence against her showed the ADSB signal from her aircraft to be intermittent. She speculates she jarred the connections loose during a few bone jarring landings in gusty crosswinds. Quote, I had made several rather brutal landings at OH 77, the 32 foot wide concrete crosswind strip just north of the bridge, and it was bumpy at low levels, she said. I did not turn it off. As for the stunt itself, which has been the focus of most of the social media attention and reaction, Lunkin said it was just a silly, spur of the moment thing. Quote, I looked over my left shoulder and I saw the bridge and I thought, I just have to fly under that bridge before I get old. The Jeremiah Morrow Bridge is 239 feet above the Little Miami River Gorge, and Lunkin said she didn't have to draw very heavily on her 14,000 hours of experience to get to the other side. It certainly didn't take any skill, she said. As for it being a reflection of her attitude towards safety and the regs, she said nothing could be further from the truth. Quote, it is not a part of a pattern of behavior, and I am not an irresponsible pilot, she said. I would never have put anyone in danger. And here's where I would take issue with Martha's statement, which hopefully was quoted correctly. She's quoted as saying, I would never have put anyone in danger, almost as if somehow that excuses her violation of an FAR by flying under the bridge. Clearly, whether someone is placed in danger is not the sole criteria for the majority of FAA regulations. But the FAA enforcement letter said that there were people under the bridge, something Martha may not have known. So if something had gone wrong during her flight under the bridge, she could have injured other people, even if she never intended to. She also said, I am not an irresponsible pilot, which I am sure is true 99.99% of the time. But in this one case, she apparently used poor judgment and clearly was irresponsible, at least for the time she was flying under the bridge. And lastly, she's quoted as saying, it is not part of a pattern of behavior. To which I would say, you don't have to have a pattern of behavior. After all, a violation is a violation, whether you did it just one time or a hundred times. It all counts the rules of the rules. So getting back to the article, a security camera snapped a picture of her passage and the FAA sent her a letter a few weeks later saying they were investigating. She said she expected to be sanctioned, thinking she might have to sit out for a period of weeks or months. FAA enforcement guidelines call for a period of suspension of 30 days to four months for the bridge stunt, which is a violation of altitude and distance from objects regulation. Quote, I knew it was illegal and I did it anyway, she said. I'm 78 and I'm still not very mature and I hope I never am. When she didn't hear anything after six months, she thought the FAA had dropped the matter. The emergency revocation letter was delivered March 19th. Lunkin said she considered appealing the revocation, but her lawyers estimated the cost at $25,000. Instead, she's spending her time watching from the ground while others fly and hitting the books to reclaim her private pilot certificate. Revocation cancels all certificates and ratings, and she had an ATP, and she has to start over to get back in the air. So far, it's been an eye-opener as she studies for the written, quote, a lot has changed in 60 years, she said. Normally, a revocation prevents the guilty party from taking flight training for a year, but her team negotiated a three-month reduction. Now, I've read a number of comments about this on social media, and they seem to fall into two camps. One camp says, hey, it's not dangerous to fly under a bridge. And the other camp says, yeah, but it's against the rules. Now, as you know, safety is a primary focus of this show, so you probably already know that I'm in that latter camp. But if you're in the former camp, I would say that it might appear to be safe to fly under a bridge, but flying close to the ground is never as safe as it seems. For example, you don't know whether wires might be crossing the river near the bridge. And if you're thinking, yeah, but how likely is that? Well, then there's still a huge flaw in your thinking. I think I've mentioned before the story of a local pilot I knew who was a retired airline pilot who liked flying close to the ground, according to friends of his from college. Sadly, on his final flight flying close to the ground, he hit a wire and not only killed himself, but also killed his 18-year-old granddaughter, who was a passenger. Objectively, I think we can agree that for over 40 years, his flights close to the ground, while perhaps not legal, turned out to be safe as he never crashed. 
But on his final flight, he paid the ultimate price for his self-delusion that flying close to the ground was safe. A few episodes ago, I mentioned an FAA study that found that 30% of fatal accidents involve the violation of one or more FARs, which is another good reason to always follow the rules. So to sum it up, yes, it's unfortunate that perhaps Martha did have a loose connection in her transponder that inadvertently led to a penalty that's perhaps worse than she might otherwise deserve. But one thing is crystal clear. If she hadn't purposely broken a rule by flying under the bridge, she'd still have all of her pilot certificates and we wouldn't be talking about this. And if she could do it all over again, I'm guessing she'd realize that that few seconds of thrill she got flying under the bridge just wasn't worth the huge penalty she's now having to pay. And let me leave you with this final thought. If you ever find yourself thinking about flying close to the ground or flying under a bridge, think how hard you work to get your pilot certificates and whether it's worth giving them all up just to satisfy a whim. And of course, my best wishes to Martha Lunkin. I hope that she does get all of this behind her at some point and can return to the skies and fly again. And I wanted to share a couple of emails that I came across today that came in recently. This was from patron supporter Ed Kelly. He says, howdy, Max. I'm so grateful for the terrific content you're turning out. While my plane has been down for avionics upgrades and annual, it's the best way to mentally get in the air and keep my mind focused. I especially appreciate the timing of your commercial checkride interview, which by the way was episode 149, if you're interested in listening to that. He says, as I'm just about 20 hours away from the 250 hours total needed, my goal is to get commercial and then CFI and start teaching once I retire. Anyhow, thanks again. Looking forward to reading about whatever goodies you're going to send. Well, Ed, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate that. And uh, sounds like a great plan to me. I've uh, heard a couple of people uh, tell me recently that they are thinking of getting their CFIs. And I want to encourage anybody who loves aviation and a passion for it to do that. Here's a message from Andy Wheatcroft. He's a brand new Patreon supporter. He says, hey, Max, I have been listening to your show for the last six months while IFR training. My third run at it since getting my private ticket six years and 700 hours ago at age 47. I must have played the Jason Blair mock IFR checkride episode 20 times ahead of my checkride six weeks ago. By the way, that was episode 129. He says, I passed and have used my IFR superpowers in uh, flights since. The instructor said that I was one of the best oral prepped applicants he had met, albeit I then created two dumb errors on my first approach, resulting in a second check ride containing one approach. Love your content, especially the life-saving IFR engine out episode, which was last week, episode 184. He says, many things in aviation mean nothing until the day they mean everything. You save lives with episodes like that. And helping me get my IFR rating helps me as a volunteer board member of Lifeline Pilots based in Peoria, Illinois, save other lives indirectly by flying more missions from home to hope. Please do an episode about organizations such as ours and the good work that GA can do. We always need volunteer pilots. It's the best use of pilots and privilege there is. Do keep up the great content. Well, Andy, thank you so very much. And Andy then sent me a link, which I will include in the show notes in case you'd like to learn more about Lifeline Pilots and the work they do. And it seems that a lot of the email I get these days comes from people who support the show. And if you'd like to support the show, there's an easy way to do that. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Use your credit card and specify how much you'd like to donate each month. And you can also read there about the different goodies that I will give you at the different levels. If you want to make a one-time donation, the easiest way to do that is go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal, and you don't even need a PayPal account. Just enter your credit card and enter the amount that you would like to donate. Let me tell you a little bit about the new patrons from the last couple weeks. First of all, about our mega supporters. I mentioned Dave Brochet last time, but I didn't tell you he's recently retired from the Navy and currently working on his instrument rating in a Cherokee 140 at the Navy Flying Club in Jacksonville, Florida. And also, I mentioned the name of Ken Matissa. I didn't tell you, though, that he and his wife, Misty, own a 2007 Cirrus at the Alpine Air Park in Wyoming and have a passion for helping others by flying volunteer missions for Angel Flight. And we have another new mega supporter at $50 a month, Chris Cartahan, and I'll tell you more about him in the next episode. And my thanks to the five new supporters who've joined us in the last two weeks. They include, at the $20 a month level, Andy Wheatcroft and Bill Strauss. Other people who joined us are Michael Scott, Todd Heiss, and Jessica Lewis-Worth. 
We also have three people who've edited their pledges. We've got Greg Williams who edited his pledge up to $20 a month. Phil Sharp edited his pledge up to $35 a month, which means he gets access to my courses at pilotlearning.com. And Kilted Piper added his pledge up to $8 a month. My thanks to all of you who support the show in whatever way you do. Now in a moment, we'll be talking with Dr. Scott Denstead about the new Easy Weather Brief app, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And just a quick note about my bonus videos, Patreon supporters at the $20 a month and up level get access to these. And if you'd like to see a video of my interview with Scott, including all the screenshots that he shared, that video will be available within a day or so. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Scott Denstead. Scott is a former National Weather Service research meteorologist, a flight instructor, and he has been teaching pilots how to minimize their exposure to adverse weather for nearly 20 years. He has written over 150 magazine articles and is a co-author of the book Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines, which we talked about right here in episode 92. Now here's our conversation with Scott Denstead. Well, Scott, welcome to the show. It is great to have you back. Good to be here, Max. Thanks. Well, we talked about three years ago about your weather sport app and then a year later about your book. You now have a new weather app. Tell us about it from a kind of high level. What are the major components of the app? Well, the goal with this new application called Easy Weather Brief is to kind of up the game with respect to uh, pre-flight uh, planning. It has a lot of the f familiar features that you see with other applications, but I took it a step further. I involved personal weather minimums into this application. We know as instructors that we try to teach our students that, that we need to make sure that we use our personal minimums, define what they are, and then stick to them. And so the application not only gives you all the weather information you need, but it also incorporates those personal minimums. And I was looking at the app last night, and I was amazed at the large number of minimums that people can enter. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about some of the different minimums that one can enter into the app. Sure. Basically, when you look at your, your flight, you're looking at three phases. You're looking at your departure phase. Uh, you're looking at your route phase as well as your arrival phase. And that's why I've kind of split it up here. So ultimately, when you get into the situation where you are looking at um, making a departure, you're concerned about, is the ceiling at my departure airport, is that reasonable? Does that fit within my current um, acceptable risk? And then you're looking also at visibility, surface visibility. And the last thing you're looking at is for, from a, uh, uh, from a departure standpoint is, am I going to be dealing with a really strong crosswind on departure? And then the other aspect is what's happening in route. So if you are a VFR pilot, you're really concerned. Are the ceilings and visibility in route going to be uh, going to be for me? In that particular case, am I going to be dealing with a low IFR scenario or just ceilings that are going to make me uncomfortable as well as visibility? And in route, you're also concerned about thunderstorm or convective potential as well as uh, the potential for icing if you're flying IFR or even turbulence potential. And then at your destination, uh, you repeat it all again as you did in your departure. So you're looking at what are the ceilings at my, uh, at my uh, arrival airport uh, when I get to the point where I'm just about ready to do that instrument approach. Maybe I'm not so comfortable with doing a 200 foot and one half mile visibility approach. So we're going to look at your arrival uh, forecast to determine whether it meets your personal minimums for ceiling visibility and crosswinds. Let's take a really simple one. Let's just say that you're entering, for example, your personal minimums for visibility at your departure airport. Now you can actually enter two numbers. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I decided to go with what's called a traffic-like concept. And it kind of in, enters into this realm of a little bit of psychology behind it. And that is, we all have our personal minimums. So if you're looking at, for instance, your surface visibility at your departure airport, you may be really comfortable with departing with a surface visibility of let's say five miles or more. So that's our comfortable, very low risk, what we call green personal minimum. Now, once that visibility drops, let's say below three statute miles, 
then you may not be very comfortable at all departing out of the airport with that kind of visibility. So in that case, that's going to be your actual personal minimum, and that will show up as red. And so the visibility between those two shows up more as a moderate risk in yellow. So red is high risk, green is low risk, and moderate risk will show up as yellow. So you get to set those two parameters, and that will help you to better quantify your risks. So when the application looks along your route of flight, at your departure airport, along the route, and also at the destination, uh, it will have evaluated all those parameters for you ahead of time. You also have a departure advisor. Tell us about that and how personal minimums uh, play into that. So yes, it's uh, it's not always sometimes about you know trying to find the exact uh, you know, weather that, that meets your, your personal minimums, but more along the lines of what time can I depart that essentially meets all those personal minimums. So once you've ent entered all those in, uh, the departure advisor will actually uh, determine based on all possible departure times from the current time all the way through about two and a half days to determine which of those uh, times will basically best fit your particular uh, personal minimums. So in that case, what you'll see is that it'll show a column and it'll, it'll isolate those individual personal minimums and it will evaluate those. So if you're seeing lots of reds, it means that somewhere along that route of flight, either at your departure airport, your destination, or somewhere in between, that your personal minimums have been busted, and that's going to be a high-risk flight. Now, if the entire column is all green in the departure divisor, that means in that particular case, it's met all your personal minimums and met them by a very conservative amount. So you're really comfortable with that flight. And of course, if there's a couple yellows in that uh, that column, then it's possibly you're in that moderate risk area and you probably should take a second look. Okay, for those who are watching the video, uh, tell us what you've got up on screen there. So I have the Easy Weather Brief uh, route profile display. And here on the left is your departure airport. So I'm gonna depart out of Charlotte Douglas Airport and I'm headed uh, via Nashville, BNA, to Kansas City International Airport. And so what we see here are the winds uh, and temperatures aloft as it's represented along that route, departing in this particular case at 15Z. Now I can change my departure advisor here and move this time-wise and you'll see how the weather essentially changes. So it knows based on the simple fact you've entered in your true airspeed and it's gonna calculate a ground speed. So each one of these particular segment points, it's going to know exactly what time you're gonna arrive based on a departure time. In this case, let's talk about a departure around 20Z. And so you'll get all your winds aloft information. So in this particular case up here, this shows you you have a 15 knot headwind component. Red means headwind. And we know that this arrow that's showing here is showing that your course from Charlotte to Kansas City is on a more west-northwest kind of a, of a heading. And so now you can see if with a 15 knot wind from the kind of the southwest, you're gonna have a 15 knot uh, headwind component. So anywhere you see red along that route, that means you know you're dealing with a headwind a component in that particular case. And you can also show the clouds depiction here as well. So you can see just how you're going to, this, how all this is going to evolve in terms of IMC. Now I've got two different colors that I show here. One is kind of a light gray color. Uh, and that's areas of, of clouds that are probably going to be scattered or few, whereas when you see the darker or brighter white, in that particular case, you're going to see uh, um, clouds that are broken or overcast. And that's also replicated here in the various different uh, segment um, uh, waypoints that are along the route of flight. And in that case, you can also then interrogate that and say, yep, that's going to be an overcast at 700 feet above the, the elevation, or that's the ceiling at that point, with a two and a half statute mile uh, visibility uh, at that particular location. So this gives you a really good way to kind of see the weather along the route of flight. And more than that, we can also show the icing potential along that route of flight, including things like the icing severity. So I can see right now I've got some heavy icing here up at 15 or 14,000 feet. And so from a IFR perspective, if I were planning that particular altitude, that's going to be rough in terms of you know, running into the serious icing. And lastly, I can show the turbulence potential along that route. So anywhere you see green, that's going to be light turbulence. 
the areas that you see where there's more of a brown shaded color, that's more of a, a moderate turbulence. And if there were any kind of, of uh, severe or extreme turbulence, that's going to show up as more of a red or even dark red for extreme. So it really gives you a quick view based on a specific departure time. And as you move that departure advisor, um, you can also see the, uh, as basically the time is changing here, you can also see how the turbulence and icing and clouds depiction changes with that. And so what you're looking down here with this departure advisor, in this particular case, we're looking at 20Z, you can quickly see that my departure uh, uh, minimums here are met with a green, but I get to some problems when I get into and root surface visibility and root icing probability and potential icing intensity along that particular route at the altitudes that I have chosen at that departure time. And then it will also evaluate in root turbulence as well as your destination field. So you definitely don't want to see lots of reds here. You want to see mostly greens and maybe a yellow or two to determine whether or not that particular departure meets your personal minimums. Well, I like that you've got the terrain along the bottom. So, for example, I can clearly see the Smoky Mountains to the west of you rising up to about 5,000 feet. Interestingly, the, the clouds there were at about the 10,000-foot level. So it looks like we've got uh, clear skies going over the, uh, the Smoky Mountains. And it's only when you're out there in the flatlands of the Midwest that you seem to have clouds that go from uh, nearly the surface all the way up to just about uh, 15,000 feet. So I guess uh, this tells us that, you know, for example, we could go above those clouds if we perhaps have turbocharging capability you could get up at some of the the higher altitudes uh, now you have options here for uh, how uh, uh, much vertical profile is shown looks like right now we're on the 15,000 foot option what are the uh, other options yeah so basically um, for the most part a lot of um, general aviation pilots fly at, you know at or below about 12,000 feet but uh, it's also important to get a idea of just how deep the weather system is. So this is the view uh, with a maximum of 25,000 feet you see here off to the left. And you can also go to a maximum of 50,000 feet as well. So when you're dealing with convection, for example, you'll see that uh, convection will often go up into the, the 40 or 45,000 foot range. So this view allows you to deal with whether or not you're probably just dealing with maybe some some just deep nimbostratus clouds or possibility of convection. So it's always a good idea to look at that 50,000 foot level first before you then dive into the, the details uh, at the lower flight levels. Good point. So on the 15,000 foot level, I thought perhaps we could get above it, but when we go to the 25,000 and 50,000 foot level, shows that those clouds are going all the way up to around 30,000 feet. So this will not be your typical GA piston aircraft to get above this uh, weather. That's correct. That's right. Okay, so uh, if I were doing this flight today and I were in uh, a piston aircraft, what would your recommendation be for me? Well, at this point in time, um, certainly if you were flying VFR, this would be not a recommended flight because you're going to be dealing with clouds, pretty much solid clouds, uh, through, let's say, when you reach about midpoint in your flight here, just shortly after Nashville, you're going to see that uh, the, the ceilings are going to go down, the visibilities are going to go down. It's going to be real difficult for you to actually make that flight under VFR. IFR-wise, you just need to be sure that you're not dealing with any convective process in place. Right now, that's not really the case here. We're not showing any thunderstorm potential. It's just as cloudy with a chance of rain, and even cloudy with a chance of mixture of rain and snow. And this is all at the surface. So you have to be real careful about that icing potential. Um, I have this shown here, set at five or about four thousand feet or so. You can play with the altitude. Uh, at this point, you can go to the route editor. You can change this uh, to whatever altitude you want. In this case, let's go up to, let's say, around 10,000 feet. Um, well, and, and in that particular case, you'll, you'll select apply. And it will go out and it will refigure all those personal minimums based on that new uh, time of, of, of departure, if you've made a change to that, but also to the new altitude that has, uh, has been inputted into the program. In this way, it'll show you uh, that um, whether or not you'll have any differences in terms of icing potential. So in this case, not really. Uh, the icing potential is really right near the surface almost all the way up until maybe 20,000 feet or so, of which some of that's going to be pretty heavy stuff. So you can set your 
personal minimums such that it'll flag it when it reaches a certain intensity or even a certain probability of icing uh, at the altitude that you have uh, have chosen. Well, this definitely shows me that I do not want to be flying this particular trip today, <laughs> or if I were, I'd perhaps fly the first half of the trip, wait overnight, and then continue later. That's right. That would be a good suggestion here. So it really shows you that that flight is pretty easy to do for the most part until you get um, a little bit more than halfway along your round of flight. At that point, either sit it down and wait uh, through the night and see if there's going to be something better the next day. And you can easily look at that pretty clearly over here when you start to get into the next day's trip. You'll notice that at 15Z tomorrow, it looks like for the most part, we're dealing with a bunch of greens. And in this case, we don't uh, predict icing probability, icing intensity, and turbulence intensity beyond about 18 hours, simply because it's really hard to predict that with any certainty. So you'll see this show up as gray that says, by the way, we're not we're not evaluating that particular parameter, but otherwise all the other parameters are showing up pretty well. And then you can go look at your clouds depiction and notice that it's not actually all that too bad. So you can depart out of this, uh, this uh, particular uh, airport and get maybe above some of these clouds um, and then work your way through altitude wise and maybe get below those other clouds as you get closer to your destination. So it gives you a really uh, extremely easy flexibility to figure out what kind of flight you need to take and, and how, it, how that represents from a risk standpoint. And I guess that the, uh, the, the ultimate option that we always have is to uh, leave the airplane at home and head over to the main airline terminal and uh, fly the airlines. That's right. The airlines are always there as a good backup just in case. And you know, ultimately, sometimes that's what happens. Indeed. Tell us about pricing for your app and where do people find it? All right, so the pricing is $79 uh, for an annual membership, uh, and that will, will get you a using the, the Easy Weather Brief application, and that's ezwxbrief.com. That's www.ezwxbrief.com. You can do a 14-day trial, uh, but ultimately you'll pay $79. And here's the benefit. Once you're with me for a year, then the renewal, you can do an auto renew for $69, or you can do a tell us what you want to pay option. I know that's kind of ridiculous in the aviation world, but I don't want price to get in the way of a potentially life-saving application here. So, hey, if you say that I think this is worth something to me, but it's not worth $69 on the renewal, then maybe, um, maybe let's do $49. Or hey, maybe uh, you saved me so much money that I'm willing to pay $109 for a year subscription. So it's up to you on what you're going to pay for the application once you've made it through the first year. And I know as I look through the app, it leads me directly to your one-on-one -on -one weather briefings. If somebody wants to talk about a particular flight that they're contemplating, how do they reach you to uh, talk about that flight? Sure. Ultimately, uh, you can go uh, to my the, the training site, which is avwxtraining.com. It's my other live training site, avwxtraining.com. And at that point, you can purchase a 30-minute or an hour session with me. So if you wanted to look over the weather along your route of flight using Easy Weather Brief, I can certainly do that for you. And the goal is not to be your briefer here. It's to, to train you on how to do that process. And after that one hour briefing, you're going to get a lot of good information about that, about your, your exposure to adverse weather along your route of flight. But you'll also, um, you'll also receive a fair amount of good training on how to do that. Scott, you offer a lot of great services. Thanks for everything you do. And thanks so much for talking with us here today on Aviation News Talk. Thanks, Max. And we're looking forward to talking to you in the future. Oh my thanks to Scott for joining us here today. He is absolutely the king of weather in the general aviation world. Check him out at avwxtraining.com or also easywxbrief.com. And by the way, my congratulations to Scott for recently completing his PhD, which is why I introduced him as Dr. Scott Denstead. And before we go, let me remind you again, please help grow the show. The best way to do that, hit that share button on whatever app that you're using send it over to an aviation friend of yours and then encourage them afterwards to either click on subscribe or follow depending upon the app that they're using because that's the best way we have to grow the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun and keep the blue side up.